Um, uh, welcome to this uh, this session. Unfortunately, not in Toronto, but on my sofa in Leicester. Um, um, uh, around the Crimp Partnership, looking at the names, I think most of you are familiar with the broad territory. But if not, the first paper will uh, uh, will take you through a lot of the a lot of the territory. We have four uh, four great papers. Uh, um, Stellar cast, indeed. Um, so we've. Um, uh, as per an email that Gregor sent out the other day, we're, we're restricting presentations to 13 minutes, uh, and I'll try and hold you as close as possible to that. Um, I didn't hear all of what Evelyn said, so if this contradicts her, I apologise. Uh, um, um, but if you, uh, but if uh, if audience be, if audience members want to ask a question, either uh, I think we'll just use the chat function. So either alert me to the fact that. If you want to ask a question in the chat function, or indeed you can write the question if you want. Um, so, um, so without further ado, to save time, we'll, uh, we'll go to the first presentation: disruption and re-regulation in work and employment from organisational to institutional experimentation. Um, I believe Gregor, turned, Gregor can tell you that this is uh, this is a paper that's um, that's just been published in trans in the Transfer Journal. I'll, I'll, I'll leave the rest to Okay, thank you, Phil. And just, uh, uh, are you seeing this now on your screen? Yeah. That's one thing I want to check. And then that should be a little better. So we just see how that works. And um, I'll try and keep the time. Thanks, everybody, for for being there. We, we have a, a series of sessions uh, from the CRIMP Partnership Project through the ILIRA uh, conference and due to the good graces of the organizers, uh, this is the first of those. And I particularly want to highlight um, how generous the organizers have been in in opening up participation. So once COVID hit, uh, we had more flexibility to integrate people uh, into the sessions. And this is a good example of this. The people who didn't originally plan on being in Toronto, like Gerhard and Oriane, uh, find themselves here with us, which is uh, which is tremendous. Um, uh, let's, uh, I mean, this project starts with four propositions, some of which are overly familiar to some of you and some of which might come as news to, to others. One is that uh, uh, disruptive change is leading to the re-regulation of uh, work and employment. Uh, knock, knock, that's not a surprise. Um, that, however, that this re-regulation opens up space for experimentation. And this is, we think, is what is, what is interesting. Um, and uh, actors of various kinds, in particular workers, are engaging in various forms of experimentation in the regulation of work and employment between different arenas. Now, the third proposition is that this can make things worse, read neoliberal experimentation. Uh, they can also make it better. Uh, along different dimensions, economic and social risk, uh, the control over working life, competencies, competencies in voice. Uh, so the big proposition and the one that we try and understand is under what circumstances, what contexts, what sets of resources and capabilities, uh, we might end up with something somewhat better uh, on all dimensions or some dimensions. Uh, so this is this is the point of whoops departure. I just have to. Here we are. So what do we mean um, uh, in this sense? Uh, uh, the I think I skipped one. I, I'm just having a okay. How to think about this? Um, uh, it's there are cognitive and real world changes taking place. Um, uh, it's the basis for current ex experimentation. Uh, uh, there are fault lines of disruption. These are provoking uncertainties. And this re leads to a reordering of forms and sources of regulation. Um, you can have, at one level, organizational experimentation, which th we can think of as resilient responses to uh, uncertainties, how social actors are uh, searching for options to regain control by building on existing institutions and creating new types of organizations, networks, and alliances, mobilizing new identities, 
promoting new understandings, you can see under there there's an, a notion of, of uh, institutionalization as well. It's, and, and this leads to the notion of how actors assess, reflect on, learn, modify their strategies on the basis of these experiments. I'm just having a, a, a few issues with, um, with uh, there we go. Okay, if I click, it, it works better, apologies. Um, and there's also institutional experimentation, which is um, uh, to a degree, whether these experiments are ephemeral or sustainable, can they be scaled up or institutionalized? And it's how actors negotiate their organizational and institutional contexts the conditions that facilitate or inhibit organizational experiments, the level at which enabling or constraining institutional conditions incur, and how social actors engage with, circumvent, or change these institutional um, conditions. And this leads us to ask, well, how do we assess the outcomes? And one way of assessing the outcome is normatively in terms of whether the work is actually getting worse or better along different dimensions. And a second way is in terms of thinking of collective capability, uh, whether workers are stronger or weaker in their ability to influence work and employment. And we argue that overall in, the, in this partnership project that we have, that this provides the basis and the challenge for more systematic comparative uh, research and action. Uh, we need to interconnect a lot of experiments and try and understand how these might be having um, an impact. And we've developed a, a template for looking at these experiments. We brought a lot of people into dialogue around the experiments. We always welcome new efforts to bring new experiments into the mix. We have conferences, we have meetings. Um, the current issue of transfer, which is open access until the end of July, that's the publication of the European Trade Union Institute, um, uh, represents a first attempt at this. So uh, in today's session, we have uh, Gerhard Bosch, we have uh, Oriane Lamine, Isabel Ferrara, Julien Charles, both doing cases, and um, uh, Etienne is doing an historical case, which isn't in the transfer issue, but which is uh, super relevant to the way that we're thinking about these cases of experimentation. Now, um, I won't spend any time on the fault lines of change re re to, leading to re-regulation. You know them, technology, climate crisis, pandemic, health threats, disconnects in identity, solidarities and values, financialization, the unbundling, the fissuring of the firm, the reconfiguration of global production networks, the redefinition of the role of the state. I think that anyone who's listening in on this say, oh yeah, that's my fault line. I'm dealing with that. And that's, that's pretty much the idea. The question is, how do these generate uncertainty and how do people seek to deal with them and reconfigure predominant modes of regulation? And those are our, our theoretical points of departure here is that um, there's a lot of crisis and uncertainty uh, that neoliberal coherence should not be overestimated, uh, uh, read Trump, um, that uh, actors are resilient, uh, but they have to contend with ag agentic and structural power. Uh, so this stimulates experimentation. Uh, a challenge to institutional legacies and typical modes of action and, and uh, skills uh, in the context of uncertainty, uh, how actors move outside of traditional repertoires of action, often in combination with existing uh, legacies. Um, Kutsenov and Sable talk about the how, how we combine uh, inside and outside the box responses. Uh, there's no uh, given response in advance. This is taking place at different levels. It can take different forms. It might be permanent, or it could be temporary, or a total failure. And a key aspect is that actors are engaged in reflective exercises of learning and developing new collective capabilities. And we argue that researchers have a role to play in these processes while giving the actors ownership for what they're actually doing. And I think you'll see this um, in the presentations that are forthcoming. Now, this is highly idealized, but uh, think of a process of experimentation where one, you're dealing with cognitive challenges, real world change, that that leads you to look for new strategies, regulatory uh, and recombinations to experiment, that you're searching for resources, organizational and institutional to deal with these changes. 
you implement the experiment, it's sometimes deliberate, it's sometimes emergent, and then you monitor, assess, reflect, learn, and modify these strategies. Now, of course, it's altogether messier than this. And we talk in our paper about neoliberal experimentation, uh, read bad, uh, which is an agenda of marketization, outsourcing and individualization of employment, demutualization, uh, and how first movers are using disruption to develop more exploitive forms of work, which leads to worse work on different dimensions, more risk, uh, less security, less control, less voice. And we argue that you can also think of a form of hybrid experimentation, which is taking these new organizational and institutional forms, there's no guarantee about this, but by combining old and new uh, forms of regulation, drawing on organizational and institutional legacies in new combinations, a form of policy entrepreneurship. Janice Fine talks about the bricolage of organizational forms and uh, an, an example of, of organizational, you can think of temporary agency work versus common platforms for bargaining and servicing, which is what Orian is going to talk about. You can talk about self-employment status of gig workers versus public procurement of wages, training, and voice. Now, when you put all of this together, and there's a lot more developed in the paper, you can think of the degree to which actors have autonomy and the degree to which institutional constraints are loose or tight so that when you're thinking about these, you can imagine um, uh, with loose institutional constraints and high actor autonomy that you can uh, provide openings to enable organizational experimentation. Uh, whereas if you go in the uh, bottom right-hand corner with low autonomy and tight institutional constraints, you're almost limited to a repertoire of resistance, which is not bad, but those are the choices you have because you don't have enough autonomy and you have too tight of institutional constraints. So we can begin to try and think of how we might categorize um, what we're looking at. Now, how am I doing for time, Phil? Sorry about Sorry, that. Three minutes. Super, okay. Um, so the, the, the challenge is to connect uh, these organizational institutional forms of experimentation um, there's a strong impetus for organizational experimentation, but uncertain outcomes, institutions may enable or constrain. It's a messy process. And in the, in the paper, we develop a couple of examples. One is of co-working, which you can see as neoliberal individualization or the emergence of new forms of solidarity for a new freelance workforce. Um, Glenn and colleagues at Bristol in particular have been working on this. A second example is the emergence of alternative union forms, forms of minority unionism. I, we took the example of UE Local 150 in North Carolina and how it's combining different aspects to try and develop new forms, but again it runs up against institutional constraints, though it's actually operating on the Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act, which makes it possible in a lot of other contexts it's not. Now, this requires meticulous analysis of how actors mobilize um, their resources and capabilities, what strategies they use, how they disrupt and transform organizations and institutions at different levels, and what we can learn from this. And of course, it requires cross-cutting variables impacting specific capabilities by uh, location and uh, social location, industry and value, ch lo lo value chain location, institutional context, uh, and the like. Now, just to, and this is the last slide, uh, Phil, is, is when, when you hear the presentations today, um, and this draws more on the introduction that we did, there's an introductory article as well with Isabel Ferreira, uh, Valeria Kulignanu, and Ian McDonald and myself, uh, we identify a number of themes. One is about experimentation as agency and power relations. Um, you, you have this resilience uh, in terms of experimenting, it involves identities, it involves mobilizing resources, it involves developing uh, new uh, capable, uh, collectibilities, collective capabilities, but you also have to contend with structural power. Uh, a second theme is that almost all the cases involve some form of deliberation, participation, and democracy, that these are critical for experimentation. 
Uh, third is that experimentation is both strategic and reflexive. Uh, there's a process of strategizing and learning from doing this strategizing. Uh, fourth, that there's a real issue of sustainability and scalability as we try and make the link between organizational experimentation, which is most typical, and institutional enablers and inhibitors, though that doesn't mean, does not mean that we cannot observe uh, the opposite and where there's an institutional change which is driving, inhibiting, or facilitating organizational experimentation. And finally, uh, the question here is one of the need for systematic comparative research. Uh, we think that this is a research agenda that has legs, and we, we draw on here um, uh, Dewey and others, and Isabel Ferraz is influential with her colleagues in this regard in saying how to nurture the democratic nature of society by working with actors to reflect critically, critically and constructively upon their actions and helping the public's capacity to solve its problems. Out. Great. Great. Thank you, Gregor. I don't know how to do the round of applause, and, but uh, um, do you, uh, would you prefer to take some questions now or do you want to wait? To, uh, I think to... we should wait and let everyone yeah. present and then see what I agree. we can make of it together. Also one that I have been kicked out of this meeting a couple of times, so if I do disappear, um, <laughs> it's not voluntarily. Um, uh, so, so we'll move now on to, uh, uh, on to uh, Gerhard Bosch's uh, 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 presentation on Industry 4.0 and union experimentation in Germany, which I'm very looking, much looking forward to hearing an update on. Gerhard. We can't hear you, Gerhard. Okay, do you hear me now? Yeah, that's great, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, uh, my uh, co-author Jutta Schmitz-Kieser is in holidays, so uh, I present uh, alone, unfortunately, and um, uh, I will present on a, um, a big program uh, of three uh, manufacturing unions in Germany on shaping industry for zero. In the program, it was written uh, uh, shipping uh, industry for zero, but this is definitely a mistake. Uh, it's on shaping. And um, I will do the following. I will um, first describe the situation of uh, trade unions in Germany, because uh, you have to understand this to understand the experiment. There's a declining organizational um, power, but high, still high institutional power, which gives the resources which are important for experimentation. Then I will talk on the role of experimentation, because this is not the first one and then on a uh, special project, Work for Zero in North Rhine-Westphalia 2020. I start with my first point. Um, uh, we have, as in uh, many other countries, a declining membership in, uh, um, of uh, uh, trade unions, and the uh, organizational power is declining. The trade union density uh, was uh, at 36% uh, uh, in 91 and going down to 16.5% in 2018, which is substantial. Uh, mainly, uh, it's due to the um, structural change and uh, uh, very, we have low, uh, uh, very low trade union density in new service sectors, while it's still high in public service and in manufacturing. And also the coverage by collective agreement uh, agreements went down from 90 to uh, 54 percent. So in many industries, uh, collective agreements do not play a big role anymore. So the out outcome is we still have a, a high organizational power in some core sectors like manufacturing, and public service, but in other industries not. Um, mainly in private services, in SMEs, but also in some manufacturing uh, industries like uh, food production. And the loss of power means uh, it is difficult for unions to bring employers uh, on the bargaining table. And we have an erosion of autonomous collective bargaining and a substantial dualization of the uh, German labor market with one of the biggest uh, low wage sector in the European uh, Union. But this is a um, paradox in, in Germany uh, and it's uh, contrary to the story in many other countries. Uh, uh, German unions still have a high uh, institutional uh, power uh, and this institutional power 
is mainly based on co-determination at brand and company level and also at some on, on some involvement uh, uh, in other areas like in vocational training but these are the the crucial um, um, pillars of organizational power the first one is there's equal representation in the boards uh, in big companies and uh, in 635 companies in Germany I'm myself a member of a supervisory board in Tyson Krupp uh, for the uh, Metal Workers Union. And we have at brand level works councils, um, uh, and they are set up in, in let's say, nearly all uh, companies over 100 uh, employees, and in about half of the companies between 150 employees, but they are not present in small companies. And these works councillors have strong rights of co-determination and also they have resources uh, and the resource question is as Gregor said very important uh, uh, works councillors are released from work they can even employ in big companies additional staff experts so the Volkswagen works council has 35 people uh, uh, 35 staff members and they can be trained in trade union training centers at the employer's cost which is also important and we have 174,000 German works councillors, and uh, there's a high trust on them, and the voters turnout is also very high, and around 8,400 are released from, from work. This is more than all trade union officials, and ne nearly 80% are uh, union members. So uh, we have this, um, this uh, contradiction between declining um, organizational power and how institutional power and in the um, strongholds of the unions, it's quite clear that uh, the institutional power is protecting a multi employer uh, bargaining uh, right now. But with declining uh, organizational power, it's only a question of time until historical compromises on institutional power are challenged and employers try to change, uh, to escape uh, um, co determination. We have, for example, continuous attacks on the German co-determination at company level through the uh, European Union, mainly by facilitating the delocation of the legal unions in other EU countries without really delocate uh, the real uh, sites where the production is going on. So um, uh, the, uh, the unions, uh, uh, um, uh, reflect, their reflection is that uh, we need to use uh, right now the strong institutional power we have in the core industries and this is a question of survival for the unions in the long run and therefore the goal is to activate works councillors for organizing new members and also for influencing the future of work and the future of work you cannot um, shape and influence without a stronger involvement of members and employees because that's finally your power base in companies. So I come to my second point um, on experimentation. And I, I have to say, I learned a lot from uh, your um, theoretical framework, uh, uh, Gregor, um, and um, you wrote um, uh, 10 years ago that unions have power resources, but are not particularly skilled at using them. This is partially true, but it's not totally true for, for Germany because the unions since, since a long time, uh, they really um, uh, use their uh, power resources, not sufficiently, but they use it. There's a high professional uh, support of members in supervisory board and uh, in works can, uh, council, of works councillors, training, professional advice, etc. Uh, um, and uh, I'm, uh, as a member of a supervisory board, I'm always prepared and we have discussions in advance, we develop strategies. And um, there were in the, in the uh, 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 last 30 years, uh, very or 40 years, very successful campaign, campaigns on the humanization of work in the 70s and 80s, on the implementation of uh, flexible working hours uh, in, in, uh, um, together with working time reductions in the 80s and 90s, and on new classification systems in the 2000s. So uh, there's a tradition of activating um, works councillors, uh, but uh, it is true that there are still many uh, passive and too compromising works councillors and there's a, um, a continuous need to replenish the stock of narrative resources and to cope with new 
with new challenges. Uh, this means the activating, activation of yesterday might have been successful, but uh, this doesn't help you in the activation of today when new problems come up. So what uh, do unions do? Um, I, I talk about the, mainly of the IG Metall, um, and uh, one new approach is they said, well, um, we need the internal reform. We have too many staff in our headquarter. Uh, more than 600 of uh, 2,000 staff were in the headquarter, and they really reduced uh, staff in the headquarters to um, free res uh, resources for new approaches in uh, companies and for um, campaigns for experimentations at local level uh, or in networks of companies. And uh, uh, they use these resources for campaigns and projects, uh, mainly organizing projects, but also for campaigns like Work Fair and Safe. This is a campaign for equal pay for temp agency worker and also for, for experiments. But uh, I have to say that freeing of resources is only possible for very for rich unions. And the IG Metall is a rich union. Um, I will come back to this. And uh, at the last Grimm conference, uh, Gregor, we had a, a short a controversial debate. Is, uh, are small unions with, uh, without resources able to do experiments or not? I was skeptical. And uh, as far as I understood your presentation today, you clearly see the limits at least. So we agree. Um, so what happened in uh, uh, IG Metall, IG Metall, North Rhine-Westphalia? North Rhine-Westphalia is the biggest state with, near, with nearly 22 million uh, inhabitants. And there's a long tradition of experiments and also of cooperation with, uh, with the state government. Um, and uh, so uh, the uh, union succeeded uh, to get uh, public money, mainly through the structural funds of the EU, for, for projects, for experimentation, and two were called competence and innovation, and the second better instead of cheaper. And uh, in both projects, the, uh, the, the unions um, worked together with the works councillors uh, in certain companies. They, they were able to, uh, to hire external consultants, and uh, the idea was to develop alternatives to outsourcing and staff reduction by improving uh, productivity and uh, work organization within the companies with uh, success, I have to say. And uh, we were um, asked to evaluate this and our evaluation of my colleague Stefan Lindorf showed that these were successful cases, but uh, um, they were developed, the alternatives were often developed too late uh, at the end of the pipe and in a defensive situation. And it, there's a need to start earlier. So this brings me to my third point, uh, the project uh, uh, work uh, for zero and uh, in um, North Rhine Westphalia. And the basic idea is um, that the focus on delocation and redundancy is too late. One should start earlier and focus on the overall restructuring of companies in the beginning when the company, the management uh, is uh, thinking of, do it, of, of, uh, of planning to do this. And um, there is was is still is a national and international hype on industry for zero. Management is also concerned about um, how to manage uh, uh, digitalization, and it's open to cooperation. And uh, the union said we cannot do this alone. The IG Metall, they, so they set up this project together with uh, two other unions. And the narrative or the idea was yes, we can shape the future of work. We are still strong enough. Uh, we have to use the opportunity. And the project, uh, 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 I will shortly describe it. Uh, there were substantial resources. The IG Metall had an own team with five full-time officials. There was state money for consultants. And we were, our evaluation was financed by a foundation. And the Work for Zero team identified companies with proactive works councils and an interested management. And at the beginning, there was a, a, a letter signed by management and the works council, a letter of commitment. And then uh, in 28 companies, there were uh, held uh, six to eight all day workshops and uh, 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 with the help of consultants. And the idea was uh, stock taking of um, structural change and digitalization in all departments, department by department. And in this stock taking, 
the employees of these uh, uh, departments uh, came and uh, attended and they were the experts of their workplace. And this meant everybody in the company knew about the project and the problems were mapped uh, and uh, um, proactive uh, strategies were developed. And this is a kind of company map. It would take too much time, uh, but uh, uh, it, uh, um, the, the, the buttons, uh, if they are green, is everything is okay. If they are red, there are problems uh, um, like redundancies uh, or um, uh, increase of skill levels without uh, uh, sufficient uh, training or uh, increasing working stress. And uh, these, uh, behind these company maps, there uh, are uh, uh, deep analysis of all departments. So what is the, uh, uh, and we attended as researcher uh, at all of these workshops, and uh, what are the results? Or was, um, um, I have to say, uh, these are intermediate results because the, uh, the process continues. Uh, what is really important is, um, uh, there was a high involvement of employees and this changed the traditional model, uh, representative model of works councillors and some works councillors didn't like that because they did before they had their, um, their personal compromises with the management. And uh, 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 what are the problems of uh, uh, Industry 4.0? I would say more or less the old problems, job security, intensification of work, initial and further training, working time flexibility, these the themes are not new, new but uh, probably they, they come up in a new form, new types of training. Uh, interestingly, the management was partly impressed by the professional approach because they said, well, these are highly skilled uh, uh, consultants. And uh, until last December, um, uh, in 13 of 28 com uh, companies, there were signed so-called future agreements. And these are company agreements with the signature of the union as well. They establish joint working groups, they monitor jointly changes, they focus on training, working time, redundancy and other issues. In the transfer issue, I have a list of the content of all these future agreements. And uh, this meant a clear intensification of social partnership and co-management. But we also had failed cases where the works councillors did not want too much trade union intervention and uh, management lost interest uh, uh, or didn't like um, uh, the okay, uh, involvement you, of unions. Time, so I come to my conclusion, very, yeah. My conclusion very, shortly. Yeah. Um, uh, this uh, uh, work for zero is a pilot. Uh, unions obtained ideas how uh, processes of change might be organized in the workplace. It's very resource a resource intensive experiment only possible with public money and the future agreements are a work program for the next years we have to see what what comes out but uh, these trailblazer companies are not representative this is evident from a large-scale uh, survey of the metal workers union of almost 2,000 works councillors representing 1.7 million employees and according to this survey, it's shown that more than 50% of works councillors regards themselves as insuffi uh, sufficiently well informed and 60% are not involved in shop, layer, shop floor management uh, policy projects. So we have now the debate, and this is my last slide, how to mainstream the project. And this was one of the main debates on, on the last trade union congress of the IG Metal. And they, uh, they decided, uh, I quote, to that end, some thousand full-time and voluntary trade union officials are to be trained as change promoters in the next two years in the trade union training centers. This training has to be embedded within an organizational reform. This means that specific projects are being put in place on the ground. Besides the joint shaping of digital change, these projects may address questions such as union organizing, uh, further training, dealing with general change, uh, generational change within the trade union, and these projects are to be grouped together thematically. This reform is now interrupted by the corona crisis. We have uh, now around 7 million employees in short time uh, work, and main the main task of unions and works councillors is short-term uh, job protection and not long-term strategies. Uh, so um, I hope that we soon come back to this. I will do a short study in, uh, in, in July on, uh, on how these companies uh, uh, proceed. And the final point, the small food workers union was not able uh, to invest so much in new programs. 
uh, so the limit of their resources means its limits uh, to their experimentation. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Gerhard, for the round of applause. Um, oh, thumbs up. That's really cool. Um, uh, so we, uh, I'll move straight on in the interest of time. I'll move straight on uh, to, to Etienne Quentin, who is hopefully there. Yes. Can you see the paper now? Uh, yes, I can see the paper. I can see the paper. Thank you. All right. Um, I feel like a bit of an anachronism today, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to present the historical case of uh, institutional experimentation for better work that uh, uh, took place during the New Deal uh, era. So um, what you have here is basically a draft paper um, on which I'm currently uh, working. I'm just going to throw it up there and you're seeing the same thing as I am. So um, in terms of context of the, the case, um, we're dealing with the New Deal era during which um, the United States government, its role in economic and social life uh, was reshaped. And concurrently, there were uh, major changes in the character and influence of the labor movement. So there's been important debates about the relationship between uh, policy decisions uh, in government and the growing labor movement. So different interpretations of the relationship between policy and uh, union revitalization. So, uh, and th this has been a subject of controversy during the New Deal, and it's still an object of debate between historians and social scientists. I won't do a, a thorough literature review. I go in the paper um, through the old social interpretation, the liberal interpretation of the New Deal, different uh, revisionist perspectives. And uh, I associate myself with what I call the new social interpretation of uh, the New Deal. Um, Nelson Lichtenstein uh, is um, a key author here. So uh, in uh, State of the Union, this book here, um, Lichtenstein argued that uh, basically the Wagner Act was a radical initiative because it sought to democratize uh, workplace relations, so counterbalance industrial democracy as it existed into the 20s. Uh, so this, this was basically a project to develop uh, industrial democracy to replace autocracy. There's another level uh, of uh, reform here that's really important. So the Wagner Act was also designed uh, to uh, create a system of economic empowerment. Uh, the idea was to raise living standards and the purchasing power for uh, the working class as a whole through reform of um, uh, labor relations. So uh, Wagner and uh, his heterodox uh, legislative aide, Leon uh, Kesserling, embraced uh, an underconsumptionist theory of the Great Depression. They said, well, to get out of the Great Depression, we need to lift uh, purchasing power. Um, this, uh, this project was already being devised uh, during what is called the, the First New Deal. So in a way, S Senator Wagner was a New Dealer long before there was a New Deal that was uh, written about him in 44. Uh, basically, uh, in terms of agency, there's a lot of, uh, uh, I'm going to focus on agency, power relations, deliberation, democracy, and uh, strategic reflexive aspects of the role of liberal reformers. So in terms of background, Wagner was uh, uh, basically uh, a, a, a leader of the progressive movement from early on. Uh, he came from a working class background. Uh, the working class district of Yorkville is where he grew up. Uh, this is where he became <coughs> uh, a, a state senator. Uh, he uh, co-directed the State Factory Investigating uh, uh, Commission after the Triangle fire, fire, and that really deepened his commitment to labor reform. Uh, he sponsored in New York State most of the uh, welfare and labor legislation uh, that took place in the 20s and 30s. So he was really, uh, even before he, he, he uh, was elected to the United States uh, Congress, uh, seen as a spokesman for the poor and for working class people. Uh, his uh, social and political thought uh, evolved over time and Wagner came to warn, uh, warn people that uh, capitalism was stagnating in the 20s. He was already uh, militating for public works to employ idle people uh, in 28, 1928, uh, basically arguing that 
there were a lot, lots of un unemployment that came with a diminution of purchasing power and uh, a slackening of business, business and industry. Uh, so even prior to the stock market crash of 29 and the beginning of the Great Depression, uh, Wagner was pushing for public works and a stimulation, uh, a st uh, basically stimulating uh, policies. Um, there was no, not much pro progress for his agenda under the Hoover presidency, um, but uh, uh, basically uh, his initiatives, but Wagner's initiatives were really the foundation for the legislative uh, uh, cornucopia of the New Deal. There was a real Wagnerian program of, I'm quoting um, Owell Harris here, um, a, a Wagnerian program of administrative intervention and deliberate, deliberate pardon me, institution uh, building. So Wagner was the one pushing for, uh, in the first place, Section 7A of the National Industrial Recovery Act. He's the one who put it in there and defended it. Uh, against uh, employers' opposition. And that program uh, reached uh, its fruition with the passage of the National Labor Relations Act in 35. Um, about the context of these reforms, basically, um, every single major uh, legislative change in the US uh, in labor relations has uh, taken place against a specific background. Uh, we have a combination of institutional labor weakness on the one hand, and on the, one, on, on the other hand, bold worker pro protests. It takes the two to uh, establish conditions for reform. And it was, uh, uh, this is what w Wagner confronted during the first New Deal. Really weak unions on the one hand, and, and major uh, worker protests and uh, social upheaval. Uh, so this combination made uh, establish the context for the, the, the Wagnerian uh, reforms. The major problem was that on the one hand, uh, workers expressed a very strong and militant desire to form and join unions, even prior to the passage of the, the Wagner Act in, in 35. On the other hand, employers really resisted unionization uh, with a whole range of practices that Wagner will declare uh, unfair later on. So firing activists, uh, enlisting uh, 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 authorities in anti-union campaigns, triggering violent conflicts. So this is what uh, Wagner confronted during the 30s. Um, he developed in that, concept, in that context the concept of countervailing power. And that's his word that doesn't come from Galbraith or anything. He, he was really writing about the need to establish a countervailing power to employers uh, during these years. But he became increasingly frustrated with uh, the way uh, authorities, employers, uh, um, and even the president were uh, interpreting and uh, uh, resisting uh, is, is uh, early initiatives with Section 7A. So that pushed him to develop the more thorough philosophy that uh, went behind the Wagner Act. Um, oh, I forgot to start my time, uh, my uh, chrono here. Where You have about six minutes. Six minutes left, okay. So um, basically the Roosevelt administration created a series of labor boards to uh, bring industrial peace and give some substance to uh, Section 7A. And um, Wagner was in the middle of this. I mean, he was, he, he was at the head of the first National Labor Relations Board and he uh, developed uh, basically uh, the idea that we needed to have elections to allow workers to decide if they wanted to be represented by a union or not, and if they wanted to um, back company unions or employee representation plans that were being multiplied uh, at the time. Uh, and Wagner said that basically is the philosophy be behind this proposal was that we must have democracy in industry as well as in government and uh, we need to have basically the same type of institutions leading to representatives of our own cho choosing. Uh, on top of this, uh, in a specific context, he started develop the, to develop ideas about planning uh, and transcended uh, the laissez-faire doctrines of the epoch. So the Great Depression, uh, the growth of influence of uh, explanations of the depression that put uh, the emphasis on 
maldistribution of income and purchasing power. That was really important. And basically what Wagner was saying is we need to encourage a closer coordination between production and income distribution in order to have uh, basically uh, a healthy economy and, and, and uh, good labor relations. Uh, his views were really contested. So we're talking about deliberation, participation, debate. Uh, there were other uh, defined constituencies uh, in the 30s. So there was the labor movement. There were legal realists with Frankfurter. There was the pluralist uh, labor relations scholars. They, had, they all had different ideas than Wagner and Kesseling on that. Um, so the priorities, I'm going to focus here on the priorities of Wagner and Kesseling uh, that were twofold. They wanted to strengthen the agency, what became the National Labor Relations Board, in order to uh, facilitate the implementation of the act on the one hand. And on the, the other hand, they wanted to create links between the enforcement of uh, workers' rights and general social welfare, saying that basically defending workers' rights was in the advantage of uh, all the population. Uh, I'm going to skip on a couple of points here, but in the end, uh, with uh, the passage of the Wagner Act in 35, we've seen uh, uh, really uh, uh, the rise of a new labor movement uh, with uh, the rise of the CIO. And there was really a, a three-year window. This is my key argument. There was a three-year window between 35 and 37, during which the progressive reforms of the Second New Deal and the new union movement could be uh, launched, but that didn't last. And my, my, my point in the paper is uh, to explain why basically the Wagnerian uh, revolution failed. Uh, and my key uh, focus here is on uh, the resistance of employers, pardon me, I'm just gonna go back a bit, the resistance of employers and conservatives to uh, this uh, Wagnerian revolution. So basically businessmen, we, we know, uh, believe that the Wagner Act was an encroachment on their economic freedom of control and rights to manage. So basically uh, they, they, they counter mobilized and they launched a counter offensive. Sanford Jacobi talks about the ideological jihad uh, against unionism to extol the virtues of free enterprise, et cetera. And so this is really uh, the, the launching of what will become a conservative movement. Business associations minutes, like the NAM, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to wrap up soon, uh, like the NAM uh, basically continue to want to crush labor organizations in uh, their plants uh, as the La Follette Committee revealed later on. So there was con continued uh, opposition by employers to union recognition. This was reinforced after that by the rise of a real conservative movement uh, in the U.S. And the third new deal, I'm going to uh, just... Uh, outline uh, a couple of teams here. The Third New Deal was really the moment when uh, Wagnerism stagnated and was eclipsed by an alternative which will become uh, Taft-Hartleyism and uh, a conservative movement that will greatly weaken uh, the, labor, the labor movement and the National Labor Relations Board. So uh, just to outline this real quick, there was a conservative coalition that formed in Congress linked King, uh, Southern Democrats and uh, Republicans, they blocked reforms and they started pushing for a revision of uh, the Wagner Act, in part because they were against the alliance between the CIO and uh, African Americans. In that context, there were increasing attacks on the National Labor Relations Board. The president tried to preempt these attacks by revising the composition of the board. So we pushed for uh, the installation of uh, some scholars associated with pluralism that uh, revised the interpretation of the Wagner Act and, and altered uh, basically what the, 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 the plan. And uh, I'm, I'm going to skip on a couple of points here. Uh, courts uh, joined uh, the fray and later on Congress adopted the taft Dightly Act, which really is now the law of the land. And uh, in the paper, I'm contrasting the Wagnerian project with what became taft Dightlyism. Uh, something that I won't be able to address here at all is the unintended consequences of Wagnerism. So over the long run, some of the aspects of the, the Wagner Act uh, worked against the goals of Wagner. His intentions uh, were... Uh, uh, good, but the project failed, and uh, I hope to be able to have a little more time one day to explain this. I'm going to stop here. Thanks.
Um, I'll, I'll, I'll step into the breach because Phil wrote me that uh, he uh, is sometimes being phased out. So this is a moment when he was phased out uh, despite his best intentions. I think that that um, uh, Etienne's uh, uh, brilliant uh, expose of historical experiments really highlights the need to uh, be able to uh, isolate and understand these different episodes and draw commonalities. Over to you, Phil, to introduce Oriane. I think you disappeared momentarily. Yeah, everyone's getting more time because the system kicks me out towards the end of each presentation. So you might want to take that into account. Uh, so the, the the final presentation, which um, I believe Oriane is presenting, yes. um, brings us back into the 21st century um, uh, and looking at the uh, smart uh, workers cooperative in Belgium. Oriane can tell us more about that. Thanks, Oriane. Thank you very much. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. I can see you at the moment. You don't see my PowerPoint? Not yet. If you have any issue, you need to click on share screen or partager l'écran. It's green yes. below. Yes. Yes. Okay. It works? Yes. That's perfect. Good. Perfect. Um, so, Hello everyone, I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to start with some words of context about the project I will be presenting because here I'm actually representing a team of researchers. Um, the paper I'm going to, to present uh, is uh, indeed the product of um, a two years long research uh, that's two dear colleagues in mine um, and me, uh, Isabelle Chereras and Julien Charles from Louvain uh, conducted. Uh, on, but also inside and with the actors of SMART. And what is SMART? SMART is a Belgian uh, cooperative uh, created in 1998. Uh, and what it does, it's, it's offering uh, freelancers some income uh, security and helping and helps them uh, to develop their professional project. And uh, so this organization fits and, and our study fits particularly particularly well in the CRIMPS partnerships ambitions, because as we will try, and I will try here in this presentation to show, um, SMART is involved in some kind of experimentation. SMART is in itself an, an experimentation, uh, which aims at bettering uh, the, uh, the work uh, situation, the, the, situa the overall situation of uh, freelancers. So, um, Four points, uh, some history of SMARTS, then a presentation of two of SMARTS main tools. Uh, then I'll, I'll try to show you why we think SMARTS is experiment, experimenting for better work. And then if I have the time, uh, I'll talk about some current challenges that the organization is facing uh, today. So some history to, to start with. Um, so SMART was created in 1998 and it was created uh, by three artists. At the time, artists were facing uh, precariousness um, in Belgium uh, as a result of a very inadequate legal uh, framework. So on the one side, uh, because they had many clients, different clients, uh, because uh, their revenues were sometimes irregular, uh, a lot of them were actually working undeclared uh, with all the risks that they involved. And also uh, because they were not employees, they would not benefit from the, the, the social rights attached to the employee status, uh, and in particular, unemployed, unemployment benefits uh, that would have been very useful for them given the intermittent nature of, of, of their work. So what SMART did in 1988, and it's still doing that today, it accepted to play the role of the employer. It became the employer. So of course, not a traditional employer, a new type of employer, maybe some kind of fictitious employer, some could say, to create some uh, income security for, for artists and, and, uh, and, and following that, it, it became very fast uh, an important actor in, in the, the artistic sector in Belgium. But the organization has evolved and changed over time um, there is a first phase uh, in, in beginning where, uh, when during during which SMART was mainly defending artists' interests and even 
uh, managed to, to, to bring about some changes in the law that was favorable to artists. Uh, so it was very, it was maybe not corporatist, but at least professionally uh, directed. And it's also then that it, it, it developed its main tools that are still, still there now. Then a second phase where the, the, the personal scope of, of, of SMART uh, expanded because they uh, started to offer their tools and services to freelancers because they, they uh, realized that there was a, a demand that's a, uh, for a lot of freelancers, some of them were actually uh, ex-employees that were outsourced by uh, uh, big corporations and suddenly uh, had to, 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 to work as freelancers, that a lot of them were facing very similar uh, problems than the ones that the, the, the artists were facing in terms of irregular incomes, in terms of problems of, of power imbalance, in terms of, of lack of social status. So they expanded uh, to any kind of, of freelancers and also, also at the time they um, developed some subsidiaries in other countries because they felt that there were similar needs of workers in, in these countries. And um, with, with the French subsidiary being the, the, the most important ones uh, still today. And then the last phase, the most recent one, uh, SMART faced a number of challenges from different, uh, of different nature, economy, legal, uh, legitimacy challenges. Uh, with, and this brought about a new leadership um, SMART uh, transformed in 2017 in a cooperative, uh, giving more power to, their, uh, to, to the workers to become members of the cooperative uh, by, by buying a share. Uh, and uh, they, they, they adapted uh, also their tools um, and also very important, uh, what they did, the, 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 the most interesting thing they did recently is offering their tools to platform careers, so to, to gig workers uh, in the collaborative, so-called collaborative economy. Because again, of course, they were very different from artists, but they shared with artists a number of needs that the model of SMART could, uh, could, could, uh, could respond to. So what are the tools of SMART? There are many of them, but I will focus on the two um, tools that uh, in our eyes are the, the, the most important ones. The first one is the, 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 the tool they call the contract tool. Um, so how it works, it looks very complicated. <laughs> on the screen, but how it works is you have the worker uh, bargaining with the client over a, a service and, um, and price, but there's no contract between these two actors. There's no contract signed. Actually, SMART will become an intermediary, will build the services to the client, and then will, at the same time, create an employment contract and offer this employment contract to the worker. This along many other tools and services, and it's not the only tool that SMART offers. So in exchange of a fee, because of course the whole structure of SMART has some costs and needs to be, uh, to be, um, to be financed by, by a percentage of, of uh, the worker's um, revenue. So that's how it works. Um, of course, what I describe is mainly an organizational tool, but what is very important to understand is that um, Underlying this organization tool, there is a complex a bundle of legal contracts that has evolved over time because the law has changed and smart model had to adapt to be sure that it fitted in, in legal categories, right? Um, but the, the scheme as it's presented here pretty much stayed from, from the beginning. Uh, what is also a, and a third layer of complexity is that the whole model that is there on the, on the screen relies on the use of an electronic platform. And that allows the system to be used uh, in a very systematic way and to be offered to many workers. So there are different layers of complexity in one organization tool that is called contract tool. And another element that is very important to understand is that workers are free to use this tool um, at various level. They can make a, a very minimal use of it by just basically introducing their data in the, in the, in the platform and be, thanks to that, being sure that their, their service provision will be declared, okay? Uh, but they can be as involved as to sign a, an indefinite term contract with SMART. So that's the other, uh, so that's the most intensive uh, use that you can make of the tool. If your revenue are 
are um, um, sufficient to ensure that you can, you can pay for such an indefinite term contract. The other very important tool that SMART has developed very early on is what they call the activity tool. And this activity tool um, is what allows SMART to call itself uh, a shared enterprise. So what is an activity? Think about it as a little enterprise with a number of revenues that are coming from different sources and a number of expenses that you can make, including hiring people, including hiring, actually hiring yourself as a worker. So it works like a little enterprise, but it has no legal existence, right? It's a little enterprise inside the big organization, SMART. So SMART is composed of many enterprises um, that are managed each time by one freelancers dealing with his own activity. So as you can see, it's a very interesting model because one single worker in this organization can have multiple roles at the same time. It can be an employee of the organization. It can be the manager of an activity, which is more like some kind of a, of a self-employed worker type of, 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 of a role. Uh, he's a member of the cooperative and can exert democratic rights in the cooperative being a holder of some shares. And also he's, he can be described as a user of the many tools, the two I just described and other tools that are there on the screen, uh, coaching, training sessions, networking tools, financial to tools where you have some kind of a, a mutuality of, uh, of, of obligations and of risks between the workers of SMART and also some ref reflective uh, tools that allow uh, workers and members of, of the project to reflect on what they are uh, involved in collectively. So experimentation for better work. Um, first, we had to acknowledge that SMART per se as such was an experimentation. And I think that um, uh, stems uh, very well from the, the, the historical presentation I have given to you, even if it was a bit too short. Um, you, you, you realize that over time, SMART has uh, evolved, but evolved sometimes radically. The, the legal tools it has uh, used has changed because of the changes in legislation. The, the, because of the change of the public it, 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 uh, it, it involves, it had to adapt the tools to new needs. Um, so there, was, there is clearly this, uh, this dimension of, of trial and error and constant adaptation to the challenges of the environment that are embedded in the SMART project and that are still very um, uh, crucial today. Uh, now that SMART, as you can imagine, is facing uh, many problems in times of COVID because the, 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 its, its mem members, as you can imagine, are uh, very vulnerable to, 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 to our current uh, situation. So it is an experimentation, uh, 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 but is it an experimentation for, for better work? Uh, to follow the structure uh, um, and, and, and what Gregor has introduced um, earlier. We, we claim that it is uh, for a number of reasons, because we think that uh, the, the, the project uh, has uh, allowed the, the, the workers to develop a number of collective cap capabilities to face uncertainties they were facing and challenges they were facing. Um, they have allowed them to secure more stable income. And this is related to the fact that of course, SMART is not a, a traditional employer. SMART doesn't give work as an employer would give work. Uh, at, at, in that regard, it's, it's an intermediary. The work comes from the client. But by playing this intermediary role, he actually reinforces the, the power situation of each single worker, and it ensures the payment of the salary, which wouldn't be the case uh, if the client would default, for example. So it's 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 an increased income security. It also uh, uh, allows workers to achieve some employee status. And this involves all the rights, social rights, very important social rights that are connected to the employment status in Belgian law, but in, in many law. Um, in, we are thinking mainly to unemployment benefits, uh, that's that these workers, if they work enough, uh, can benefit from for the periods they don't have they, they don't find work, um, but also to, to, to workplace 
uh, accident uh, uh, protection that um, that these workers, if they were self-employed, would not benefit from. So these are clearly two examples of of rights that are uh, connected to the employee status. But we also you're claim on, you're, just, you're just over thirty minutes now, so if you can. Uh, you can wrap up. Okay, okay, perfect. I, it, it's the end. I'm, I'm not going to talk about the challenges, but I will answer questions if people are interested. So I'm, I'm just finishing this, this slide. Yes, sure. um, so um, so we, are, we also claim that, and it's partially based on the fact that there is increased income security, of course, uh, that also uh, the autonomy of, of uh, workers, of freelancers, in the definition of their own work is uh, enhanced thanks to the tools. Uh, and, uh, uh, the tools of the, acti the activity tool clearly helps them to, 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 to get this autonomy. This increased autonomy uh, is also found in the new type of government that the firm has established uh, in 2017 because the cooperative uh, 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 allows them to play a role not only in the definition of their own work uh, in their own activity, but also in the definition of the collective project of, of SMART. Uh, so uh, increased autonomy. And finally, and I will not uh, uh, explain in detail why, but um, uh, the, 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 the capability to face the disruptive nature of technology refers to the role that SMART has played in the last years uh, to help uh, platform workers uh, to, to, to face the, 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 the situation, uh, to, 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 to uh, solve some of the problems they were facing. Uh, one of the reasons of these problems were a very unfavorable legal framework for, uh, for these platform workers. So we'll end up here, but of course, uh, if you have more questions, I'll be happy to, to answer. Maybe I'll just tell you that uh, we also wrote a, a bigger report, a very long report on this. Uh, so you, 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 you can read the transfer article first, and then if you're interested, uh, you can go in and check the rapport, it's in French. So, <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. Great, thanks very much, Ariane, it's an excellent presentation. Um, so we have, again, you've got thumbs up from Gregor, which is on the chair. Can Evelyn take off um, my presentation? <laughs> um, so, uh, um, so we've had a, a, a presentation of the, of the framework from Gregor. Um, and then three di three very different substantive presentations on showing kind of the the vast sweep of of forms of organizational institutional experimentation which we're kind of <laughs> trying to make some sense of it in a project both 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 facing contemporary challenges um, but also um, taking instruction from uh, uh, um, uh, uh, f from historical patterns, uh, uh, and Etienne's presentation is very important in that respect. And what it uh, uh, and some of the things about uh, actor capacities and power that it leads us to think about. So I'm going to open the floor for questions. I think the seeing not a lot has happened in the chat. I think the easiest way to do this is with raised hands. So um, so for those, for anyone who doesn't know, if you click on participants uh, at the bottom, there is one question in the chat box, uh, Professor Altman. I think we lost Phil momentarily there. So yes. if we can just pick him up. Uh, who is the question from, Evelyn? Uh, Asaf Bandi. Asaf Bandi. And I think while we're waiting for Phil to get back, what we'll do is we'll take a bunch of questions and comments uh, and then have a single round of responses so that we can better manage the time. And when you're back, Phil, take, the, take over the mic. So Asaf Bandi. Asaf Bandi, would you like to unmute your uh, microphone yeah. and ask your question? Perfect. Yeah. Hi. Thank you very much for all these presentations. They were fascinating, all of them. Um, my question is addressed to the presentation, last presentation did by uh, Orian, um, and I wondered, um, following this new uh, experimentation or the uh, creation of this new actor in uh, the Belgian labor market, uh, what is the relations of traditional unions to this new actor, and how 
how can you describe the interactions between traditional unions and collective bargaining uh, and this uh, new, new platform of collective uh, representation? And uh, Phil, you're back now, so you can take over. But while you were gone, we simply yeah. said that there was a question in the chat from Asaf, and then uh, you were explaining how people could raise their, their hands. Yeah, well, we'll deal with the, uh, I don't know who the question from Asaf was directed at, but whoever it was, you can answer it. <laughs> but we, we, we suggest that we take a bunch of questions and comments if we could, but if, if, sure. if there's a lack of questions, then Ariane can come in, sure. I have some questions for the other speakers, but I don't know if I first. Why don't you? Why don't you ask that? Why don't we collect a few questions? Yeah, okay, okay. Questions I'll do that. Then. I'll do that. Um, yeah. So I, I have a question for Gregor. Um, I it might be a stupid one, but I, I, I struggle with the concept of institutional experimentation uh, and and the idea that I, I wonder if once an experimentation is institutionalized, does it does it is it still an experimentation? So that's 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 my question, and and it also relates to the, the the scaling of experimentation. I I struggle with that in my own work right now. Actually, I work I'm working on other experimentation, and and I'm I wonder if it's sometimes uh, it's so contextual. Experimentations are so contextual that they I'm not sure that scaling up is a proof of success, but but I'm not sure. It's an it's it's an open open question. And then I have a question for for uh, Mr. Uh, Bosch. I don't know if, if, if still, ah, yeah, okay. Um, I, I wonder in this uh, four four point zero uh, uh, initiative, what was there uh, uh, in the plan an increase uh, in uh, decision making offered to workers uh, on other things than working conditions, and by that I'm 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 meaning strategic decision making, because you, I, I understand that there was an increase in participation in many aspects of work, mainly the betterment of working conditions, but was there also a rise in the participation in strategic uh, decision making? Great, thanks, Orion. I also see a raised hand from Mathieu, did we? Uh, thanks, uh, my question is for Gregor and for the general framework of experimentation. So one, one thing is that if we want to scale those organizational experimentation, it, it takes a lot of uh, deliberative capacity and reflexiveness. So I wonder, uh, in the context of COVID-19, do you think there's an opening space of deliberation, or uh, the gap is 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 much more uh, widened or or closed in that regard? Thanks. Great. And um, Gregor, did you have your hand up as well? I, I do indeed, and um, uh, it's a question for Etienne, um, uh, and, and uh, it's, it's the following one uh, in Etienne. You might say that it's out of, it's completely out of phase, but you might be familiar with the uh, ambition of the Clean Slate project, uh, and, and if not, it's, it's no matter, because the question can be asked nonetheless, the Clean Slate project coming out of the uh, working life uh, at Harvard, uh, making a set of arguments that it's now time to reform U.S. labor law. And um, it, it might be a dumb question, but uh, if you had uh, two lessons or three lessons to draw from your very fine-grained analysis of uh, Wagnerism and how the seeds of destruction were sown into the third phase itself, uh, I wonder what they would be. And if you say, forget that question, I'll think about it for another day, that's okay too. But but I, I think that there's really something that's interesting in what you're doing that says, how do we understand labor law projects and how can they go uh, uh, so wrong or ultimately uh, open up collective capabilities for workers? Great, thanks. I'll, I'll now take the one uh, remaining question from Sean, who I didn't realize was here. Hi, Sean. Um, Hi <laughs> uh, yeah, so a, a quick question for Gerhard. Um, when I did research on Bialdi, I noticed that the works councils um, diverge considerably in their abilities to coordinate across companies based on size and ownership structure uh, to the point, and you had mentioned that service, you know, and 
in a lot of service industries in Germany, they don't have the power that you would see in manufacturing, for example, to, to engage in such levels of experimentation. So I, I believe what, uh, I agree with you on that point. So my question though is, um, uh, in the case that you examined, uh, was coordination less of an issue or were there any divergences? Um, and if there were divergences, how were these overcome? So it's just a question of works council co uh, coordination, the ability to exercise influence over them. Uh, the discussions, the negotiations that were happening. Great, thanks, John. Um, uh, so, so um, we'll answer these que those questions now, and we'll see if we have any time at the end of that. I think I'm going to go in reverse order of the presentation. So, if we start with Oriane. So, thank you very much for this uh, for this question, uh, because it was actually one of the points I wanted to to talk about in the in the challenges. So, so it gives me an opportunity to to share some thoughts on that. Uh, so the, the relation uh, between smart and, and traditional unions has been a, a, a fluctuating and problematic one uh, uh, from the beginning. Uh, at the very beginning, it was because to a certain extent, uh, smart was starting to playing a role of representation that in some regards was similar to the one unions were playing. So there was a, a problem of, of, of competition to a certain extent. But then uh, uh, unions uh, framed another critique to the smart model that I think is way, is way deeper and, and is addressed partially by smart is that uh, the unions said, we cannot, uh, we cannot support this model because it, it, it fosters more precariousness among, among the workforce. It doesn't create a sustainable, uh, long-term uh, 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 employment, because of course, as you understood, uh, it's based on the fact that it's the, the workers themselves that, that that bargain for their own revenue. Okay, so so smart is not a traditional employer, and that is a critique that not, must be heard, even if the intention behind smart is indeed to to increase uh, the, the situation of, of power of, of workers. But this, so the, the relation between smart and union has evolved, and in the last years, they collaborated. Uh, more often, and on the case of, of um, couriers, on the case of platform work, actually they they uh, entered together in a very interesting ad hoc collective bargaining attempt to sign a collective agreement between the platform, smart, and unions representing platform workers. Unfortunately, this initiative failed because of the, uh, the, the platform in, in question uh, uh, quitting the negotiation. And the last point I want to, to, to make, because I think it's, it's very important uh, for us thinking about uh, efficient responses, is that, um, of course, SMART is not a normal employer. It's at the same time an employer and a representative of, work, of workers' interests. So it's super important to think about the implementation of traditional labor law inside SMART. But it asks fundamental questions, because you cannot build collective bargaining in the same adversarial uh, uh, way as you do it in a like, typical industry, as you do in, a, in, in an organization that is built to help you developing your own activity. Thank you. Is it my turn, Phil? I think we lost Phil again, so go ahead. Uh, I, I think it's uh, Etienne's turn and then yours, Gerhard, following Phil's logic. Right. I'll be real quick. This is a really good question. I wasn't aware of that project, uh, Clean Slate Project, Gregor, but I know a lot of people that say, uh, keep the preamble of the Wagner Act and scrap the rest and restart all over again. So I think this, is, this must be part of this. Um, one of the key problems with the way things evolved is that the counter mobilization of business and, and uh, conservative uh, lawyers and judges um, meant that basically old common law constraints uh, have been resurrected from the grave and, and, and apply again. And uh, the values as, and assumptions of labor law in the US have, have uh, there's, there's a constant and the, the, the Wagnerian revolution didn't really uh, uh, undermine these. So um, what I'll do is I'll keep your question in mind and I'll come back <laughs> with a thorough answer at our July meeting. Uh, we have a meeting that's supposed to take place in Amsterdam. So maybe I could draw that out. Uh, by then and also what I'll try to make sure is that the more uh, the aspects of the paper dealing with political sociology itself of institutional change will be more drawn out uh, for, for the next paper. I'll, I'll also make a PowerPoint. 
Cheers. And, uh, and I also want to mention that Etienne's first reaction to COVID was uh, he then wanted to do a case of experimentation on the bubonic plague and the Black Death and work regulations. So. <laughs> Great. Well, I, I'm glad the uh, questioning uh, asked question and answer session is going swimmingly with my only partial presence. Um, so <laughs> we'll move on to uh, Geha. Yeah, thank you for the two questions. Yes, uh, Sean, uh, uh, coordination uh, was absolutely crucial uh, because if you leave works councillors alone, um, uh, then uh, they often uh, uh, do certain compromises with companies and uh, as the project would not go, would not have gone the same way. So what uh, at least the IG Metal uh, did is uh, it was a strong coordination uh, at each um, meeting in the companies, there was a, a trade union official present and uh, it was really in a helping and advisory role. So very uh, well done. and. The, um, of course, the uh, heterogeneity between the works councillors was substantial. Some were, were very uh, experienced, had strategic visions and others not. Uh, so uh, what took place was a kind of collective learning. Uh, there were workshops uh, with uh, all works councillors from the 28 uh, uh, companies. So this was a network of 300 people and learning from each other. And uh, this was done completely differently in the chemical workers union. This union didn't want the evaluation by our research institute. And they uh, were a little bit uh, afraid um, in uh, too co coordinating too much because their uh, works councillors had their independent deals. So they, this union is uh, because of a completely di different uh, uh, tradition in another situation, but coordination is crucial. Uh, for for joint learning and also for uh, for uh, institutional reforms and learning of the uh, of the trade union as a whole, and I'm not sure that this takes place in the same way in the chemical uh, workers union. The second point by Orian was on strategic uh, questions. My answer uh, there is a legal answer and an answer what really happens. The legal answer is that uh, in the supervisory board you have a certain impact on strategic uh, uh, um, decisions because uh, let's say for example you can uh, uh, be, uh, you, you also uh, nominate uh, the CEOs and also uh, big investment decisions and business plans have to, uh, to be decided in the supervisory board. Of course the management side can all, always overvote you but they don't want to do that. They want to reach a consensus. Uh, Overvoting uh, is uh, very unpopular because this uh, creates conflicts and they do not know uh, what kind of conflicts uh, uh, will um, result from this. And uh, so um, I can say from my own personal experience, uh, uh, we discussed uh, huge investment plans uh, um, at Tyson Group right now, uh, right now, the investment plans for the next five years uh, about uh, nearly 1 billion uh, euro. Uh, so, um, in detail, it's developed by the management, but it is discussed and there is some input from the, from the expertise uh, from the uh, union and works council side. Uh, but there are companies where it's different, where, uh, uh, where the management really has a confrontal uh, 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 management style and they just to tolerate the, uh, the, the union side because they have to do that, that's because it's law. And the, the actual at the company level, if there's no supervisory board, the Works Constitution Act gives strong co-determination rights on overtime, on many um, human resource issues. But uh, if you really play the game, uh, uh, if they don't give you information on strategic decisions, um, let's say on investment plans, on the introduction of new technologies, you, can, you have some strong means uh, to, um, to sanction them by not agreeing to overtime, for example. Uh, and if the company has learned that the works councillors have such means, then they often over years of joint learning, they say, well, it's much better to have a cooperative uh, work uh, style. And uh, so we have in many, com many companies with good works councillors, we have a very cooperative uh, uh, style, management style. And um, 
and uh, so the, 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 the union side and the works councils have a certain impact on strategic uh, decisions. But the last word always, of course, have, have the owners and the management. Great, thanks, Gerhard. And finally, Gregor, which I think is going to take us to the end of the time, isn't it? All right. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Phil. I'll, I'll, I could be extra short and then leave you with the timing problem. Uh, but let's call out, first of all, to uh, uh, give a, a recognition to Min Li, who's following this from her home in Guangzhou. So it's just coming up to midnight. Uh, so I think that she gets the, the badge of valor for her thank participation you. in this session. Yes, yeah, thank you, Gregor. Yeah, and I just, uh, yeah. And, and, and what we also want to say in that respect is uh, she'll be also on on Saturday morning. So you, that, that will again be nighttime for her. Um, on, uh, I, I just want to make a comment, first of all, on, on Oriane's wonderful presentation and the really interesting work. And I think an interesting aspect of the experiment as well is how it gave these workers a collective capability to negotiate with the state which went with their status, but the state actually made adaptations in, in the way that the laws were administered in order to reinforce the status of this worker. And it never would have happened, I don't think, without uh, an SMART. I'm speculating in this respect. And I, I make a parallel case here, which is the uh, uh, childcare uh, unions in Quebec and their ongoing campaign, uh, which ultimately said, there's no way we can have a pension plan uh, daycare center by daycare center, um, mostly cooperatives, uh, many nonprofit or most nonprofit. Um, so the state needed to step in and uh, make specific arrangements. And when we can call it, a, uh, this this is leads into your question about what's what's experimentation and what's institutional experimentation, and at what point um, uh, it's uh, it. it, it, it if it's institutionalized, can it be experimental? Well, I mean, I think that there's a sequential aspect here where you're trying to think of institutional solutions. So maybe you can say that initially the ability to recognize the SMART uh, cooperative members for purposes of social security and unemployment uh, started out on an experimental base, basis and probably might even remain an experiment. And if it can be quote unquote scaled up and extend or diffuse to other groups who share a similar status, then we can see a more thoroughgoing institutionalization. Now, this, if you read the literature on institutionalization, you know the problem that you're in. Some people just throw up their hands uh, because it, it has so many different meanings. Um, the, the, you're not going to get uh, specific agreement between historical institutionalists, uh, organizational institutionalists, discursive institutionalists. Um, they're, they're swimming in their own uh, rivers. But what we can say, we, we, in our paper, we went from someone like Scott, a very simple um, uh, set of distinctions, though complex to apply, of saying institutions have three pillars, something to do with understanding, uh, something to do with norms, and something to do with rules and the regulative aspect. So when you combine all those three together, uh, you begin to get something which is more stable over time. But I agree, and we need to discuss this much further, we're wrestling and we wrestle in that paper between what's organizational, what's institutional, in what sense is institution are, are inhibitors or enablers. Um, and, and, and I think that Gerhard, illustrates that very nicely of the enabling, but often unrealized possibility that German institutions provide to workers, but you need to occupy that space, which takes us to Matthew's question about COVID. Um, and yes, there's a real potential for the COVID crisis uh, to mean uh, something different and to open up new collective capabilities, but you have to combine all of those aspects. And I just take the example of, uh, are sudden, and it's not sudden for us, but the, real, the public realization, which is translating into a form of understanding, which says, if you have a, a bunch of people doing really awful jobs in multiple establishments for poor wages and working conditions, apart from it being bad work, it's also bad health policy. 
well, you're beginning to have an understanding there, but how do you then translate that into norms and to rules uh, which will have a permanent effect? And that's the space that we need to occupy. And um, uh, it's going to be a very a differentiated uh, process where, where it goes back to part of the resource question, the imagination question of how people can occupy those spaces. And our argument in the project, and, and it's, a, it's an open architecture project, is that we can benefit greatly from the cross interrogation of cases uh, in, in this way of, you know, it's not publish something and then I on to the next thing, but it's rather, let's look at what you've done and see how we can compare that with something else and then with something else. And uh, the bad news I have for those of you who are involved in this is that we have a new uh, uh, and improved version of the template, uh, which we were about to unleash in English and French on you. So that will be the next phase. And then turning those into prose uh, uh, pieces, uh, independent, uh, but in, uh, of course linked to the uh, papers that we're publishing. And finally, I refer back to the special issue of transfer just because we did negotiate until the end of July open access to this. And not everyone is in a university institution uh, that has access to everything, A and B. They're all the people outside of university institutions that don't have access. So if you can take advantage of this one and we'll continue to try and practice this open architecture, but this is thanks to uh, the ETUI, the European Trade Union Institute and SAGE, we were able to do this. So thanks very much. Great, thank you. Um, clap, clap, clap to everybody. <laughs> Some people, yes. <laughs> um, so, um, so there's, a, there's another, there are further sessions of this conference that start at 12, so I shouldn't abuse people's uh, time too much. Um, there are further sessions from the, uh, uh, from Crimped uh, this afternoon, 13.45, I believe. Um, so you can join some of us for that. Um,